Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Kevin Burgess of Burgess Forge. I first saw Kevin on Forged in Fire, on which he forged a championship Pira, a Filipino short sword that I've always loved. Uh, he was featured on a second episode as well, but I met Kevin at the Texas Custom Knife Show, where I got a chance to talk with him for a while and check out his beautifully forged buoys in person. We'll check out Kevin's work and find out how he came to be a journeyman bladesmith. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and download the show to your favorite uh, podcast app so you can listen on the go. Also, if you want to help support the show, you can do that on Patreon. Quickest way to do that is go to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon or scan the QR code on the screen. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Have a knife you want featured or reviewed? Call the Knife Junkies 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and let us know. Hey, Kevin, good to see you. Welcome How's back and uh, welcome to the Knife Junkie podcast. Uh, it's good to be here. It's good to finally be on. Yeah, I said welcome back, but really it's, it's more like good to see you again. <laughs> yeah. It's been, uh, you know, about a month ago, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, mm -hmm. We were in the Texas. I was in the Texas uh, uh, heat with you and we were I was holding <laughs> yeah. your bowies and we were talking. Uh, so it's good mm -hmm. to see you again. Uh, how did that show yeah. go for you? Yeah, it actually went pretty well. I actually ended up selling a couple of knives there. Um, I actually sold one for my uh, journeyman set um, to a guy. He just came up and was like, hey. I want that one. It's like, oh, cool. <laughs> so that's always, those are always the really fun sales. You know, it's like, you know what? I want that one. And they go ahead and just pick it up and, you know, just swipe a credit card or whatever. That's always the good ones, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you're not talking them into anything mm -hmm. or you're not, uh, having it, they just have their mindset. Uh, so you said your journeyman set. And yeah. I mentioned in your intro that you're a journeyman bladesmith. But what does that mean, really? And uh, tell us about that. Yeah, so um, as far as for me, um, the journeyman set really goes as far as showing your craftsmanship as a bladesmith and kind of what tends to be, at least in your base natures, the primary um, kind of pillar on which everything else goes out from. So if you can make a journeyman set, you can make a master smith set because everything's pretty much there. Your lines are straight. Everything's clean. Everything's well put together. And after that point, it's just kind of, you know, embellishing it, you know, a little bit more, putting a little flair on it. And so that's kind of, you know, why um, I went after it is because it's just it shows a certain level of uh, knowledge on what you're doing. So a journeyman, that's like the first level of mm -hmm. um, uh, mastery before becoming a master in the yeah. um, American Bladesmith Society. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, so there's the apprentice and then there's journeyman, though um, apprentice right now is just kind of you, hey, you joined with the ABS and um, you have, you know, they don't have anything currently, but I am hoping that in the future um, they're looking towards possibly maybe doing something where you have some kind of test for an um, apprentice, or at least I'm going to hope that way, because I think it'd be fun, you know, just have, kind of get people more involved in the community, because that's kind of at the end of the day, what we all are as bladesmiths is just one really big community I, you know i i know people always talk about you know on these you know kind of forged and fire like shows uh, like what was one of them uh, inked you know you ever watched inked uh, i have not but I, i'm familiar with the format yeah so it's just it's that but with uh, with a bunch of tattoo artists and some of them are just real nasty towards each other but whereas with you know with forged and fire where we are told before getting on set and starting up you cannot physically help people with their knives because I guarantee you if people were allowed to, you know, physically help people with uh, making their knives and something happens, you know, some guy, you know, heat stroke or something like that, or, you know, maybe they just, um, you know, have something happen that they can't uh, do a certain process that they need to do. I, you know, if it wasn't for that rule, I guarantee you'd see at least every couple of episodes, somebody like, you know, hey, let me grind on yours for a little bit. Mine's blue up anyways, you know, just something like that. Well, that's something I hear consistently, um, whether I mean, not just from people who compete like on Forge and Fire, but just uh, the knife community in general being a place of, of great generosity in terms of, uh, I mean, collectors like myself and, and um, 
um, you know, people who review knives and stuff, but also uh, makers, how generous they are with their information mm -hmm. and their, um, I don't know, hard, hard earned, hard won sort of techniques and stuff. Uh, so journeyman, what, what's your journeyman test like? And, and what does that mean? So as far as the journeyman test, you can go. Kind of, so there's two parts to a journeyman test. So you have your first part, which is your performance test. Okay. So you make a knife between, I think it's the current rules on it are eight and 10 inches long, 15 inches overall, uh, maximum, and has to be two inches wide. Well, you have to make that knife and it has to go through, you know, performance tests um, that including a one inch, one inch thick uh, rope slice in one slice. Uh, you got to go through a two by four a couple of times and still shave hair at the very end of it. And then the big one that everybody, you know, if you've been on Instagram or Facebook or whatever, you've probably seen a journeyman test at one point where they're sticking that knife into a vice and just bending that over 90 degrees. And that's, and that's kind of like the big one um, of, you know, Hey, do you really understand heat treat? Because anybody can make a knife that holds a good edge that is, you know, relatively durable, but it takes, that more advanced knowledge to be able to bring that into a knife but also have it survive something that's you know more than catastrophic you know more than anything you would ever see anybody do in the field it, the the british what is that called the british sword test or something like that the british... yeah, yeah i think i've heard of that you know it's kind of see what it does so basically they put the blade in a vice mm -hmm. right and uh, this is one of those beautiful beautiful buoys that you've labored over to bring to the <laughs> test one of five knives of various sizes i guess that you bring to your journeyman um it, it, and this test is usually a blade show right in atlanta well so for the performance test you actually go to a master smith shop and that's you know kind of why i hope that eventually they do something with apprentice um but you have to go to a master's shop um and basically test with them i actually tested with uh, lynn ray he was a great guy to test under went to his, uh, went to the kind of museum that he's runs and or is at, um, down in, uh, Arkansas. And it was just a wonderful time. <laughs> That's cool. Well, I, I just, I, I want to, um, for people who don't know, I want to describe this test because, um, it, it, it's absolute torture, especially to people who, who cherish knives and who, who don't <laughs> make them and who think they're yeah. beautiful, uh, things to think of putting one of your knives, any one of the ones I saw in a vice and then you put a mm -hmm. pipe over the handle yeah. so you have leverage to just crank on it and bend that blade and then mm -hmm. uh, it, you i guess the goal is to get to near 90 and then yeah. return it to and, and then it should return to true uh and that that is a true test mm -hmm. of your ability to heat treat and temper a blade right uh, well one thing that i actually will correct you on um is that it doesn't have to return to true um okay you, okay it would be cool if your knife returned to true but usually they do they do take a set um okay you know and and it is to a 90 degree you have you have these old yeah. guys you know with coke ball glasses out there trying to judge 90 that's always that's always fun but um yeah <laughs> they uh but yeah no they're looking from the side for that true 90 and then they're seeing what you have and actually i think i have it in this case just off screen so i'm gonna quickly reach on over because i didn't even think about pulling it yes there it is so this yeah. is actually the journeyman knife here let me go this way this is kind of this is the journeyman knife that i made and i'm a huge proponent of forging our blades um so i'm going to kind of divulge a little bit um if you want to call yourself a knife maker that's fine if you just do stock removal but i think that to be called a blade smith specifically you have to forge your blades and that's why I specifically chose this one. And you can actually see right there, I have a little bit of a Keesler Integral Guard on there. Oh, nice. Just because I like, I like forging, you know? That's one, of the, that's one of the things that really interests me is uh, doing a good job at forging. And so um, I've decided to uh, make it uh, kind of one of my interests as I kind of continue on with this as a career. Well, I, I, I think with forging... Uh, you know, there are ways, uh, if, okay. So I, I had an art upbringing and, mm -hmm. uh, if you look at stock removal, you could see that as pop art in a way or art that you can, mm -hmm. uh, easily reproduce for the masses, which is awesome. 
Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and all that being said, uh, stock removal, I'm not saying that it's easy oh, to yeah. have a business doing that. I'm just saying it's repeatable in a way mm -hmm. that forging is not. And, and then mm -hmm. the forging would be more like uh, the painter who takes a long time to make one painting and it's, you know, <laughs> it's unveiled yeah. and it's a kind of a, uh, each individual is an individual in a, in a different sort of way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think you really hit it on the head. I mean, it's kind of, it's each one, you know, each hammer blow that you do each, you know, little just indent in there. You can try, you know, you can try for the rest of your life to make the exact same forged knife, but in your lifetime, you probably will never hit it. You know, it's just, it's such a unique thing. Well, okay. So how did you get into this? I mean, obviously you're, you're, uh, you're accomplished. You seem like a young man to me and you're and you also seem accomplished in this, uh, craft, this art that is, um, you know, takes some doing, it's not something mm -hmm. that you just, uh, jump into and do great at, but I mean, what really, what is like, that? <laughs> yeah. not, not much worth doing, but, uh, how'd you get into it and, uh, how did you become serious about it? Um, I gotta tell you. Um, so my uh, my story is I'm a giant nerd. <laughs> I um, I absolutely love video games, anime, TV shows, all that. You know, the whole nine yards. And whenever I was still um, kind of in, in in my high school, um, we we were actually given computers. So our school ended up testing a software program that ended up going out to pretty much everybody else. And I remember just one day finding, oh, I can't even remember who it was. It might've been Alex Steele or some, or somebody like that on, um, on YouTube, you know, whenever I first found them, but it's like, I went down a rabbit hole and there was a good period of probably two or three years where I watched every single, you know, blacksmith bladesmithing video on YouTube because I'm like, okay, it's, it's lunchtime. What am I going to do with, you know, after everything? So I just watched, <laughs> watched YouTube videos on making knives and, um, and on me, that, that's where I was uh, going with that. Is all, if you've ever seen uh, Ah Me uh, with uh, Matt Stagmer and Ilya and a few and a few other people in their shop, that, that sounds so familiar. Yeah, uh, what was it? Uh, Man at Arms. Yeah, yeah, do you remember Man at Arms Reforged and all that? Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think the episode that really did it, that kind of made me like, wow, that's really cool, was actually back in the original of um, Man at Arms. It was whenever they made uh, Sokka from Avatar The Last Airbender, whenever they had made his sword with the actual meteorite. You know, well, well, 15 year old me, my eyes lit up and it was it was all downhill from there. That <laughs> was, is funny. It was yeah. on making knives. That's uh, Avatar, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's a show that uh, my my uh, daughter watches. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's funny for me to hear because um, I'm, I'm tw twice your age. Uh, not yeah. not to not not to uh, highlight my my age or be ageist, but uh, <laughs> it's funny to hear you say that because um, I had a huge, you know, I was always a you know artist, a drawer when I was a kid, and I was really into. I never played Dungeons and Dragons. I know that you you're big into it uh, mm -hmm. but i was very influenced by the art on that and then the art on the sci-fi books that my best friend used to read i didn't like the books but i loved the art mm -hmm. uh the um uh so you were saying that um you're influenced by this kind of stuff and yet your style uh when you look at your work seems very traditional american mm -hmm. um how, how do you how do you account for that um, it's, it, it, it's more so what got me interested, um, than any one particular thing. Cause, it, because I originally found this, you know, cause little, little me is like, okay, I want to make a, what was it, a kunai from Naruto or, you know, any kind of, any kind of Japanese blade, honestly, with, uh, most of the animes that I used to watch. Um, but, um, after trying to make stuff like that, I was like, wow, okay, there's a lot that goes into this. And then that's where I really dived into everything. I was like, okay, what's going to make, you know, what flows well, what, you know, cuts well, what, you know, feels good in the hand. And then it was just that side of YouTube afterwards of like, okay, here's how you actually make it into a craft. And maybe it's just the fact that I'm in the sticks of East Texas. Maybe it's the fact that, you know, I just like buoys. <laughs> I think I just really like buoys. <laughs> Um, that that ended up being my main style is, you know, as much as I enjoy the nerdy stuff as me as a person, it's it's just not my style as a maker. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I do. And uh, it, it's interesting because um, 
you know, uh, if if you can differentiate between the fantasy uh, world of uh, the, those kind of animes and how those weapons look, mm -hmm. and then and then look at the real world um, examples, um, you're going to come down on your side every time. And I guess what I mean by that is, and I'm going to go the long way around here. Sorry, Kevin, but Conan the Barbarian, the original, one of my favorite <laughs> movies of all time. Mm -hmm. And then we we all know that the swords were amazing. And then in 20, I don't know, 13, they remade it with Jason Momoa. Good casting for Conan the Barbarian, I would say. But mm -hmm. the swords were atrocious. They looked like they were inflated like oh. balloons. And uh, it really was distracting for me. And I think it probably added to how bad the movie was. Um, so if you, if you can't kind of look at what's realistic... And then kind of recognize that some things are fantasy and should be left in the animated world and don't try and reproduce that in a live action. Mm -hmm. so, well, <laughs> I would imagine that 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 really actually plays out uh, as a knife maker because mm -hmm. uh, you want to make a useful tool as well as something beautiful, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, you know, a lot of people have this kind of, you know, with knives being separated into an art category versus a use category. And I think there is a place for that, but I think that the, um, at the level of making that is required for something to exit the world of being a knife and purely being an art piece. And this is actually going to go a little bit into my, <laughs> my art upbringing, the few years of college that I did it. Um, you know, I think that, you know, if we're going to talk on a semantics basis on, you know, what makes art, I think that, you know, for the vast majority of people, we still make um, these beautiful tools, um, but they should all still be useful. You know, I think that that level of craftsmanship that you know is required to take it, it into purely just being art, most people um, probably aren't going to want to do because I think that most people, at the end of the day, you know, internally want to make something that's useful. You know, it's wonderful to make something for the beauty of it, but I think that you know. A lot of people, you know, in that get into this is primarily to be a maker, you know, and I think that kind of translates into most people probably wanting to have that, you know, it could be beautiful, uh, you know, a, you know, work part that, you know, nobody's ever going to use, you know, some Damascus, you know, mammoth ivory, gold encrusted, you know, whatever knife. But at the end of the day, I think that the true craftsmen that are doing a really good thing is making those beautiful knives, but also making it so that they aren't just mounting pieces that you could you know zombie apocalypse happens all that good stuff you could use it <laughs> right and you want to be the classiest zombie slayer on the block yeah yeah <laughs> yeah I, I i feel like um with the with the art you know uh with art if you really want to make something that's truly only beautiful then you don't make something that's also useful mm -hmm. I, I i can never quite get to calling a knife um art if you can cut mm -hmm. with it it's mm -hmm. designed to me it's it's artful design or whatever mm -hmm. uh but it's um you know even if it uh, yeah you know we could mm -hmm. we could <laughs> we could talk about that that all day but but yeah, i think so, like yeah. be, having an artful approach to everything mm -hmm. um is is let's we've talked uh, uh, abstractly let's see some of your work <laughs> Uh, yeah, besides let's, besides let's, the bent journeyman work so that people know what we're yeah. talking about here yeah um let's get the let's get the crowd favorite um this one is my personal favorite just because it is just kind of mm. that classic buoy it's got a little scroll guard on there i decided to just do a flat one just because i wanted to kind of play a little bit safer just because of the size of this thing and also you know but oh, so look at see. that if I can get it to line up. Something so like it almost that. looks like the uh, sound hole on a violin, almost. Yeah. Yeah, it kind of does, doesn't it? Never really thought about that, but yeah. So that's a Musso-style blade, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And who was Musso? I, 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 know I used the, the name, but I, I don't really know the story. So I'm gonna I'm gonna surprise you. I also don't know. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I know I know the name. I I've looked at a lot of I have looked at specifically a lot of Musso blades because that actually ended up being what I would call probably two Ooh, from my God. set. Here, yeah. one second. Let's go. Yeah, there we beautiful. go. This one's sh this one's showing up just a little bit darker. Let's yeah. Maybe it is that dark. It's just the lighting in the room, but it's normally a little bit browner, a lighter brown, a walnut color. But 
it. Um, but yeah, no, I'm gonna surprise you too. I don't know <laughs> who he is in the history of Musso either. And, and um, the, the the thing is, is I have known. It's just mm -hmm. uh, gone through my head like a sieve, unfortunately. Uh, so <laughs> like all uh, good information, right? Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> we know that you love buoys, but like, how would you characterize your knives? Are people buying them? And um, I mean, they are definitely worthy of putting in a glass case and if i had one um i wouldn't have any use for it but just pure appreciation because i live a pretty uh, low speed lifestyle uh but what what do your customers come to you for and and how do you characterize your knives to the public yeah so as far as my custom work um like whenever i just could be able to get you know, kind of creative freedoms, like, hey, make me a buoy knife, you know, that was one, and that's kind of like my favorite words whenever I get a custom order is, hey, make me a buoy knife, and here's my budget. Uh, but I like to draw, um, I like to actually have my clients kind of help me in the drawing, in the initial drawing process of, hey, here's what we're making, here's what we're kind of abstracting, and, and with some people, I've like, actually, because I know them a little bit better, I've actually specifically asked them, to draw me up what they want just because I want to see their interpretation of what, you know, they think looks like a cool knife. And it's really interesting is looking over what people, you know, kind of make is you see, you know, certain, you know, characteristics, even though these people have probably never heard of Musso or James Black or any, you know, kind of big knife making name, um, you still see a lot of influence in it. It's like, okay, so this person has a lot of kind of, you know, the Arkansas toothpick style to them. They want something nice, lean, pointy, you know, or, you know, whatever other buoy design that they might uh, think up. But it's really interesting to have them do work with you and um, kind of make their dream knife for th from there. Well, uh, so is this at all related to you? You told me that you studied jewelry making. Yes. Um, does this relate in terms of your approach and the process that you learned uh, because that was a formal education you got there right mm -hmm. yeah yes so uh how how did that how how did the process that you learned uh in jewelry how does that how has that carried over into knife making um a lot of it because that was because um, those college years of you know learning to make jewelry is kind of whenever i really kind of dug into this and learned the finer points, I actually went and took the ABS intro to bladesmithing, you know, their two week long class. Um, and I really started getting into it. And it's really just this step after step system of, okay, you do this, you, you know, you do this, this, and then that final, you know, those are your steps. Here's why we do those steps. So like if, if say I'm setting a uh, stone in something, I want to polish out the inside, um, you know, the inside of that bezel where I'm not going to be able to get to, um, later on without scratching up the stone or getting past metal or whatever. Um, I want to, you know, polish that now, set the stone, and then that way I don't have to worry about it. And kind of the same thing goes, you know, with knife making. You know, whenever I'm putting on a handle, I want to polish up the little, this little front bit of the handle before, you know, I put it on because I'm not really going to be able to get there once I'm, you know, it, I'm all glued up and everything on the knife, you know, you can't really get in there. And I think that, you know, just the one, two, three step process has really helped me kind of dial in. It's like, okay, I need to really think about this. How is it going to impact, you know, what I'm doing later in step five, what I'm doing in step one um, and all those kinds of things. I think that was a really big help as far as actually making this more um, of a smooth process instead of just a monkey flailing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think the, the sort of comfort of having a, uh, a checklist is important in, and it's not mm -hmm. just, you know, you know, I, and I mean, in creativity, not just in flying a plane or, or building a house, but even in the most creative sort of um, uh, ventures, like uh, with what I do at work or with what I do, you know, outside of work, uh, mm -hmm. oftentimes they require um, me doing the same actions in the same order and developing a system for them. That's one of the things I've tried to instill in my, in my daughters is, is part of the fun of like learning. I wish I knew this when I was younger. Like, and now I'm saying it, like I knew yeah. it all along. Yeah, but... Teach me your wisdom, old man. Let's hear it. <laughs> <laughs> part, part of the fun. And I know, you know, this, and this is kind mm -hmm. of what you're talking about is developing a system. 
Uh, mm. I know where I'm going. I've done it a few times this way and that way. And some of this has worked and some of that has worked. Let's figure out the best way to make this repeatable and, um, and, and enjoyable. And, and, mm. and, uh, well, I mean, to me that, that is something that took me a while to discover for myself. And, uh, mm. uh I, I think that that can be comforting in certain kind of processes and processes like, uh, especially like knife making. Yeah, um, definitely. I mean, just kind of like, you know, uh, forging, you know, like I said, we're going to go back, uh, going back into forging, you know, you forge the tip first, then you, you know, once you have the tip, you know, you start drawing on choil after that, you know, start getting some length and width on the blade and then just do your final and then do your final cleanup forging from there. Um, simplified, but uh, bear with me that I don't describe forging for an hour. Um, but, um, you know, just kind of that step-by-step -step of, you know, of doing those, you know, just very fundamental things really helps in cementing them in your mind and making you really, really proficient with them. Well, so how did that, uh, help you in going into, uh, forged in fire, for instance, this is taking your <laughs> passion and your love and, and it's more, you know, when you're doing something like that, it's also something you hate and you struggle with too, I, I'm <laughs> yeah. sure. Uh, but but it's your passion for sure. So how did how did how did you translate that in the systems you sort of uh, made for yourself in your home forge when you weren't under the gun? Tell us about going into the competition. Going into forge and fire, man. That that is truly an. If, you know, I'm gonna feel uh, I'm gonna feel a little bit old for saying this, but um, uh, going back into forge and fire, I still remember uh, me and my friends. Um, just we had a, a little Discord server for, full of a bunch of us younger um, bladesmiths, and I remember we did a uh, forge and fire challenge during one summer, and um, I came in second place on that one to actually what later ended up being another forge and fire champion, um, but. Um, Kind of the the process and setting up that process and taking it from home to the forge, it was actually it was really similar. I'll tell you what, I know that a lot of people have had you know weird stories just because of the challenges that they were through um, thrown into. But for me, it was harvest some steel off of a wheel, which is really just these little bits of you know 1095 that we then stacked up. And it's like I've done this a million times in making Damascus, and that first round. You know, except for remembering where to go to stand in front of the fan versus, you know, go to the power hammer and not just kind of, you know, close my eyes, pretend like I'm at my own forge. Um, you know, it was it, that first round was I've done this a thousand times, you know, just went through the process, just almost automated. And you, what did you have to make a big 13 inch? Yeah, it was it was a, yeah, it was like a 13 inch, you know, knife of your own design. You make it, you know, however you want. And um, I think what was the challenges? We had to chop into a boat cleat. That was that was it. We had to chop oh, into a boat cleat. Um, and, I'll, and, and I'll tell you another thing is I can't remember what um, the other challenge was because we um, actually didn't get to it. And um, also in the making, I was I was just making a knife how I normally do. I wasn't really thinking about the challenges all that much because it's like I know what I make is, you know, a good knife. And I remember thinking afterwards, um, whenever I saw the boat cleat, like, oh, yeah, that's right. We have to chop into a boat cleat. I, I probably should have put a little more meat behind the edge. But, you know, it ended up that my knife ended up actually surviving um, the best out of the uh, three that were tested. Um, the other two actually had uh, failures on their blade. That and, was uh uh, it, it's a daunting thing to watch mm -hmm. those tests yeah. uh, because you see <laughs> how much blood, sweat, and tears go into mm -hmm. making those knives in that quick amount of time. And then just to see them, you know, and, and, and also it's, um, you know, in, in one way, it's a real test of, mm -hmm. of the Smith and, you know, how good they are. But in another way um, it's, it's also, uh, not necessarily the most fair, it, yeah. but it's a competition. Oh, yeah. That's the point. Uh, but mm -hmm. I mean, like most people aren't really forging under those circumstances, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. so they might have a different pace and all that. But oh yeah, um, I remember one of the things because I um, one, the guy that I actually lost to, he's uh, just another state, and I remember I brought him down for like a couple of weeks to make knives together. And I remember during that couple of weeks, we actually made it land so that we go to uh, one of the ABS hammer ins, which if you haven't gone, by the way, I highly suggest going to just find a hammer in near you, go to one. They're great. 
Um, but I remember both of us came up and we brought our blades and we were like, hey, can you judge this? You know, because I forget who we had judge our blades, um, but it was one of the Mastersmiths that was there. And we were just like, hey, can you, you know, judge our blades? And, uh, they, and he gave us some criticism on both ends. Um, but he was like, yeah, no, I know, you know, in that whatever I do in my own shop, um, I could never do on that show because it takes me, you know, a day to grind a blade. It takes me, you know, a day to put on the handles and make it perfect. But that's because he's a mastersmith. We are very much so not mastersmiths, especially at the time. And, you know, just because somebody fails there, um, they might be an amazing smith. And just because something somebody does great there, maybe they, you know, they might not be the best smith in the world. Still good. They made it to the end, obviously. But, um, I think that it's, um, you know, it speaks volumes that, um, you know, just anybody is able to do anything in that short of a time. Because if, you know, for all of those, uh, my knife making uh, brothers out there and sisters, um, it's hard. It's very hard work. Well, you uh, made it to the finals on your mm -hmm. on your show. And uh, it would tell us about the weapon. Uh, oh, the Pira. That I was love a fun that. one. <laughs> yeah, because I'm noticing a few swords that I remember seeing whenever I um, whenever I was doing my research on the plane uh, on the plane back. Um, but yeah, no, the um, Pira was just a, a really fun um, blade that um, just it was just so weird, man. Because um, I'd never made those kinds of blades before. I'd always I'm always very you know as you might be able to tell I'm a bit Western in my mm -hmm. style, yeah. so I don't I didn't have really that kind of Filipino background um, a whole lot. So um, it was kind of a shock initially seeing that, um, but it was just, it was a crazy blade. And I remember um, one of the things I did is like, I wanted to do a lot of research on this. I knew that I wanted to have this be kind of a special piece because that might be, be the one thing that sends over. And I remember I learned, um, and you're going to have to pardon me if I'm butchering the names of it, but I think it was called like an Eureka nut, an Eureka nut and a hoi hoi leaf um mm -hmm. that um apparently so whenever you are a new person within this particular tribe that what developed i think it was the yakan tribe or yakan tribe um that developed the pira um apparently whenever you like go into their village kind of the hi hello meal is a, a reka nut and a hoi hoi leaf and you're just supposed to eat it and that's kind of like your hey you're welcome to the village and i decided to put that since i'm kind of an outsider coming into their culture for the first time oh, i decided cool. to actually put that on the side of the handle because there's just all that you know area kind of behind that i you know if you remember the um remember the blade i just kind of had it like off hanging off whereas if you look a little bit more traditional it kind of follows the arm a little bit more yeah, um, I, just yeah. Wanted, I just wanted it out of the way i didn't want to mess with it but um but yeah, no, I remember um, carving all that in there because, you know, do some research on your knives, you know, make if, if you're making a knife that belongs to some culture, or, you know, people or whatever, do a little bit of research on it. Do good by them. You know, it's 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 fun. It's interesting to learn about all these different cultures, why they did certain things, you know, um, what influenced them, you know. Um, yeah. looking you know around the world in, in blade design it's just it's a really interesting thing that i think more people need to take a look at yeah and the philippines are an incredible mm -hmm. place to look because so many islands so many um you know uh uh communities and all have their own blade designs mm -hmm. with their own uses and stuff and uh just beautiful stuff and exotic looking and very very effective um mm -hmm. so did did working on that and uh kind of stepping out of your comfort zone to make that uh did that influence the work you did afterward did it open up your eyes to things or um i'd like to say yes but um it was an interesting task to make something that big um definitely with learning how to make larger um larger blades that's obviously helpful i think to anybody because if you can if you can make a long blade good if you can make a long sword you can make a dagger kind of thing um it's um just it, it helps push those skills out like okay i do have them but i never sadly i never continued with anything in that kind of realm of knife making uh i do plan on it eventually i actually still have the original little billet of metal that they gave me for um for my pira you know whenever they send you i don't, I don't know if i'm allowed to say this but i'm pretty sure i am because it's not anything 
particular, but um, they actually send you home with what with an amount of steel that should make the weapon. That way, you don't have to like special order stuff. You know, oh, that's that. cool. Yeah, um, and I actually still have that out in the shop. And same thing actually for the long sword um, for my second episode. Um, I have both of those out in the shop. And one of these days, I'm gonna you know why not actually see if I can't make it out of what they gave me. So did you get to keep any of the weapons you made? Um, I did keep get to keep the long sword. However, I looked for it, and it was in a gun case, and I do not know where that gun case is right now. Oh, um, it boy. is it is mixed. It's mixed in with a bunch of other gun cases, and it's like eh, I don't feel like bothering other people for uh, looking for it. So sadly, I do not have uh, the long sword to show off. Well, but, let's hope. Uh, let's hope you don't need a gun, and you open up that <laughs> case, and you're like, ah, oh, sword, <laughs> almost. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, go go in, you know, it's in, instead of um, it, it, instead of just uh, racking a shotgun, he's more of a have at the, you know, all yeah. that stuff. <laughs> yeah, stand and deliver, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, so you had so the Pira is like about a twenty nine inch bladed mm -hmm. sword, I think, or knife. You know, if it's anything yeah. like most, almost all the Filipino swords kind of fall into a certain measure. Uh, but but then you said you did a long sword. Um, what, what was the, um, you know, history channel is the host of that show. And mm -hmm. so everything has to have a historical, um, attachment. What was the actual sword you're supposed to make? I know European, but what was it? Um, it was a German long sword. And I remember because that thing was near to about here on me. Um, I'm not a very, um, uh, I'm going to out myself. I'm not a very tall person. I'm actually, um, but I think the blade was, 38 inches and then there was 10 more inches to handle wow. so not not a whole lot of um you know it's uh, not a very uh insignificant blade it was definitely a challenge to grind but yeah no that uh that that german long sword was definitely a beast so did you have to uh retrofit or or buy a new uh, forge or how, how do you like you know when you're not making swords how do you suddenly mm -hmm. pivot into that um Here's what you do. Yeah, you, you get you you know you get past round three. It's like okay, I'm going home to make things, and you you call your parents. It's like, hey, do we have any uh, fifty gallon drums, metal drums anywhere on the property? And they say no. And then um, <laughs> after yeah. some finagling, you find some and you and you get them home. Um, but yeah, no, the, um, I I owe a lot to my parents for you know helping me out with this. Um, but I uh, but yeah, they. Um, the week uh, you know that kind of that day of travel back because you, you're allowed two days to kind of prepare um and for those two days um, i remember spending one of the days making a uh, dawn fog style uh, heat treating kiln it's uh just what it, all it is is just two 50 gallon barrel drums stacked on top of each other with some ko wool around yeah. it and it does a great job at heat treating swords and that's what i had to use because i couldn't make another forge that would you know accommodate something that big nor did i really want to so uh in terms of your knife making in general and and mm -hmm. burgess forge how what's your business trajectory like if if that makes sense like yeah. um what what is it describe your business and and then describe what it's like a day at the job yeah, so actually right now I'm in the process of actually, um, sadly or happily, depending on how you want to look at it, I'm actually transferring over to having this be more of a um, very intense hobby, <laughs> a very, very intense hobby, um, yeah, because I'm actually taking on a job as a, uh, um, I'm, I'm now a roofing salesman, if you can believe it, I figure if I can sell knives, I can probably sell a roof or two um but um so what we're um so that's just kind of the transfer over into just kind of having this be a side thing um and some people's like oh man he, you know he didn't make it well you know what yeah yeah i did i don't get to be my own boss anymore but i will tell you i don't have to you know stand at a grinder for you know the entire day just grinding the same type of knife because I have a, you know, an order for 20 whatever knives, you know, and I think, and, and I get to just make things that make me happy. You get to validate my kind of more creative side and you know what, I'll, I'll take it, you know? Yeah. Especially if you're, if your business model and you want your mm -hmm. business model to be what a lot of knife makers strive for, uh, which is making what you want, 
mm -hmm. putting it up and people, you know, uh, people who follow you and people who like your work mm -hmm. snatch it up. Uh, to me, that seems like, uh, you know, the, the dream job right mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and not for nothing, uh, at my daughter's recent uh, birthday party, one of her, uh, one of her children's fathers, uh, is a, a roof, uh, regional dude and mm -hmm. uh, they do very well so uh mm -hmm. that's a great way to support a knife making habit slash hobby because um <laughs> very you know it. yeah it can be a, a hard road to hoe and I, I i luxury goods are are always in demand but you mm -hmm. know the question is how many hand forged buoys uh, are people looking for and mm -hmm. um i mean I, I i'm sure that's something that never goes out of style uh, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, I mean, I mean, let's be frank, the economy is what the economy is nowadays, you know, things are getting more expensive. Um, you know, kind of, kind of one of the things that made me kind of think, okay, I have to sit down. Is this, you know, a good long term for me? And, you know, eventually came to the no conclusion was, you know, recently got a stable, uh, recently in like a pretty stable relationship. Um, you know, kind of wanting to have my own house, you know, kind of be able to afford those kinds of things. Um, you know, and it's just like, yeah, I could scrape by on knives. I could, you know, pay rent with knives. I could do all that with knives, but I'd like to have a little bit more, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. I do indeed. I mean, this is, uh, this is something most people face or a lot of people mm -hmm. face, especially if they have a, a passion that is in any way impractical. Like if your passion isn't stockbroking, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, it can, it can be impractical. And, uh, uh, but yeah. And, and plus, uh, when you have, um, when you have maybe some time and you have already a lot of skill built up, you never know where life's going to take you and mm -hmm. you never know, uh, where having this intense, uh, uh, hobby and talent and drive, because you're still, planning on becoming a master smith oh, i would yeah. imagine oh, yeah. um you know you never know where that's gonna take you and 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 right now given the circumstances it sounds like you're you know you're you're doing what you got to do doing the mm -hmm. responsible thing yeah. um well i, I have a question because i keep looking over mm -hmm. your shoulder at the knives i want to see some more uh, okay. but also i want to know about leather work uh, uh so if while, while you're grabbing a couple of um, yeah knives. here let me um show off let me see. so this is from that my my personal favorite so this ain't mine <laughs> that's, man, that's um, i wish it was mine i wish i could say that um i did all this leather work but um and here let's see if it won't focus uh, who is that i i see a big ass that's about yeah that. it's uh smith salary he's actually a uh local sheriff was game warden you know you know the story local old sheriff guy you know he did saddle work you know every time every small town's got one um <laughs> and um yeah no i i found him actually through um i was doing a knife for a client he's like hey i want it i want your knife but i want the sheath from this guy and wow. And I got in touch with him. I he actually made the sheath in front of me. I remember because it was just a little tiny sheath for a little hunter. I made him, um, but he wanted his um, he wanted his name embroidered on it um, or engraved, whatever you want to call it, with the uh, patterning. And he put his name on there, and he sewed it together. And I was out the door in 20 minutes with a sheath, and I was like, wow, wow, that was that was crazy, you know, tooled and everything. Um, and so that was just kind of the you know uh kind of like uh light bulb moment moment for me i didn't have to spend so much time on making uh on making the knives or making the sheets but yeah let me grab um another one that i really like um this is one that i made a while back actually oh, yes i remember this one that's a double edge that's a fully double edged yep. knife but so cool and i got silver inlay all the way around it because i um so this this goes kind of actually I, I, if i'm not mistaken it's been a while since it's actually been a while since i made this knife um but um i remember i watched i think it was um alan newberry newberry yeah 
um, I watched one of his videos on um, some wire inlay. I was like, that looks like a lot of fun. And I have something that I wanted to put a coffin handle on anyways. Um, and so this knife then got a whole lot of silver put into it. And um, I'm just really happy with it. It just it feels like that, you know, gentleman buoy that, you know, I kind of wanted to make with this because it's very, you know, the handle's very, you know, ornate. It has all the scrolls and, and everything. Um, and But the dagger's, you know, double-edged Damascus. Yeah, that's a that's a knife that you um, fight mm-hmm. over a over a card game on a riverboat. Yeah, yeah. You stab it down in the middle real dramatically after you lose your hand. Yes, yes, but you're dressed like really cool, and you have a couple of six shooters on you. That mm-hmm. yeah, that is a beauty. What what is the origin of that style of blade though? It doesn't look like a regular buoy as I know it. Um, that's kind of my interpretation of just a shorter almost kind of like um i i i like to with a lot of my designs i like to look at nature um because that was one of the things whenever we were studying design in school um was hey nature has a lot of these designs has a lot of and um, and doing more research into that um and learning about um you know just kind of that nature makes things specifically for um, doing things very effectively. Uh, one of my favorite stories was uh, the uh, Japanese trains, their bullet trains. Um, their lead designer was a avid bird watcher, and um, he noticed that the kingfishers, you know, dive into the water and just went straight uh, straight into the water. And so he shaped the front of their uh, trains like a kingfisher, you know, uh, head. Hmm. And it actually cut through the air and it, and it stopped some of the problems they were having. I think they were like causing sonic booms as the trains would go by or, you know, suction or whatever. And it, you know, fixed all that. And that one's actually, I kind of based it off of a, a rhino's horn, just this big piercing, very, very dramatic, um, you know, front edge. But I just wanted to have it be kind of this rhino horn, very stout blade, um, even though it's actually very thin. Yeah, that would be a, a a really great fighting knife because mm-hmm. any sort of thrust would make a a, a fight stopping wound, mm-hmm. and uh, and you got it on both sides. I love that knife. I I, mm-hmm. uh, I I remember that one, and the handle is pretty memorable too. Uh, that silver inlay, silver mm-hmm. wire inlay. Yeah. So is, so is that a a skill, and is that one of many skills you're going to need as you go for for this? Uh, Master Smith, I know, th- I know that they have to do a fluted spiral handled, yeah, double yeah. quillion dagger. <laughs> yeah, which is yeah, insane. The, yeah. Um, so with the um, so one, so one of the big differences between journeyman and uh, master uh, for your um, tests for your um, fit and finish tests is one. Obviously, the Master Smiths make their stuff out of Damascus. Um, but two, you actually do have a knife requirement, whereas with your journeyman, just meet a couple of, you know, length requirements, make these, um, you're good. With Mastermind, they actually tell you, you need to make a, Quillian, a European Quillian dagger, um, because Bill Moran, whenever he was, you know, kind of founding the ABS, he was like, you know, this is probably one of the hardest knives there is to make and make it good. Um, cause you have, you know, it's a dagger you're working on basically two knives at once that need to be perfectly symmetrical. Um, and then not to get into all the handle bits, you know, on, on a Quillian dagger, but it is a very, it could be a very taxing knife. And if you can do that, well, you can probably do just about anything else. Well, and, and you need braided wire, mm-hmm. yeah. like three bits of braided wire, right. Going down flute. I mean, mm-hmm. it's amazing. Uh, th- those are beautiful to look at. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you can imagine a different era when, where, attention to detail like that was the was the norm uh, that that puts you kind of in a very 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 long line of um people yeah uh, mm-hmm. you know uh in in the world who have made these uh these kind of things um mm-hmm. so uh you teach people you have classes tell me about that yeah so um one of the things that you know is kind of the big side of my business and the big side of kind of like my knife making journey um, is teaching people. Um, I absolutely love teaching classes. That's, you know, not only for me, you know, on the business side, is it a good deal for me because I get to make a knife, you know, as I'm showing these, you know, these people, you know, what to do whenever they want to make a knife. Um, But um, as we go along with it, um, you know, we, you know, just, 
talk through everything. I get to pass on all that information. And um, I want to say it was Steve Schwarzer who said it, um, you know, for every person you teach your lifespan doubles. Um, and, you know, that, that was kind of one of those really, you know, I'd been teaching for a while, but um, I think that is what actually kind of pushed me over as far as, wow, I really enjoy, enjoy teaching. And this is why, because um, I get to kind of make a, you know, an imprint on the world and kind of, you know, show, um, you know, this craft that, you know, at, at a certain point was pretty much forgotten. You know, I mean, luckily, you know, some people might have their, you know, own opinions, but I have my own. So I'm going to speak it on, you know, I think that, you know, for all of Forged and Fire and some people, you know, having whatever their opinions are on it. I think it's overall a really good thing. I think bringing more people into this, making people more aware of the craft is ultimately a good thing. I don't see a way in which that becomes a negative, you know, because the more people that enjoy it, the better. I, I like having more people in the community. I, I don't want to have, you know, just a small little, you know, five dudes in a, in a garage. I want to have, you know, you know, this kind of nationwide, you know, family that's, you know, you know, all really dialed in on this one thing that we do. Some people get bitterly possessive of their mm. interests. Like, oh, I would rather like no one know about knives and they die with me than, <laughs> than everyone yeah. else. Yeah, it's like, I was way into knives before everyone else. Okay, yeah. all right. Uh, yeah. But uh, Fortune and Fire has been amazing because it has yeah. also helped normalize. I mean, not mm -hmm. only for the art, it's been great for the showing off uh, how knives are made and mm -hmm. uh, in, in that more traditional way, but it's they've also helped to normalize knives in general the fact that mm -hmm. people carry them and use them every day and they're not uh they're not uh you know carrying them around as weapons yeah they don't yeah. have to be these scary things that you know people yes that the, that the weirdos hold in their pockets you know the the one kid you know at the school line who's always showing off his little pocket you don't don't have to be little you know that it can be these you know high class pieces these you know kind of talking points you know all that kind of stuff and yeah you know, yeah i think that you know fortune fire has done a lot of good for the knife making community it's brought a lot like i said it's brought a lot of people it's brought a lot of awareness and i like all of it <laughs> And yeah, and it, it it's also very it, it's it goes very against uh, the sort of um, temporary culture we live in, or, or disposable culture. Because yeah. here yeah. here you're making knives, you're seeing how they how they can be made individually and how how well they can perform. Whereas a lot of people, you know, they'll buy, for instance, kitchen knives or cheap pocket knives, and then mm -hmm. when they when they get dull, they kind of just put them in the drawer or throw them away and get something new. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Th this one's for all the knife makers. Oh, I'm sorry. My, my, my son, he has a collection of knives. He has more knives than he has what to do with. And you know, every single one of them is $20 from Walmart, <laughs> 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 you know, but, yeah. Uh, but yeah, there, um, there definitely is that kind of um, just, it's nice. It, <laughs> it just really is. It really is nice. I, I, I I thoroughly enjoy um, what Forge and Fire has done for the community at large. So are you, um, as you make this transition into, into a part-time uh, knife maker, um, are you taking orders at all or are you just continuing to make the knives you want to make? Uh, mm -hmm. or, or, I mean, have you begun making the knives you want to make or are you finishing up orders and stuff as you make that transition? Yeah, I am finishing up my last three knives these are the last probably custom orders i'll take for a very good long time um unless the order is hey i want a buoy and here's a budget <laughs> you know um i think you know and, and like i said i think that's kind of one of the things that i think i'm going to enjoy about this is like i have the freedom to say you know what no i don't really feel like making whatever kind of weird knife you know i want to make this and I'm not really going to be bothered if it doesn't sell, because if it doesn't sell, I have another source of income coming in. So, well, then what is it? What, are, what is your dream knife? What do you want to make? My dream knife is just a really nice big buoy, silver, you know, gold accents, you know, just kind of that whole nine yards of just that really classic front of blade magazine buoy. Okay. All right. All right. 
So uh, I'm being selfish now, and I'm gonna say, okay, besides a buoy, like what, what, <laughs> yeah. what are, like are you are you Tonto curious? Are no, you, okay, uh, okay. Oh, so 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 for like a fun fun knife, yeah. yeah. Um, I would love to make. Um, so um, talked about D and D earlier. Um, I, my baby is is a half orc paladin named, named Thorg. He is my first character. He is actually, um, I kind of transferred him over into another campaign that I'm in. Um, and he is my baby. My <laughs> he, he is mine, and I love him so much, even though he's ugly. Um, but um, one of his things is he's a uh, Oath of the Ancients, and so that's very plant-based. Um, and I want one day, and, and his, his main thing is he has a giant kind of like, um, it looks like the vines from, you know, like Spanish ivy uh, for the handle. And it's just a giant um, spiked maw, you know, on the Ooh. earth, you know, that he just swings around. And I would love to make that for no, you know, obviously just just have fun just to just, you know, make something just to make it. But that would be the ultimate of, you know what? I just want to. <laughs> yeah. Home defense. And, you know, I bet, yeah. there, I, I bet there are plenty of people out there who who would who would like it i mean mm-hmm. uh like you were talking we were talking uh earlier about enthusiast groups uh dungeons and dragons that's a that's a huge enthusiast group mm-hmm. you know uh i i can remember like i did not play it but i remember my friend's older brother playing it all hours of the night mm-hmm. you know when i was sleeping over um yeah i mean i think there's and and then you look at the books lots of mm-hmm. just cool cool mm-hmm. swords Very and cool knives stuff. Yeah. from those books uh mm-hmm. so uh, one last question here at texas how how has texas the uh the state influenced you and and how do you think it's uh, gone into your knife making um i mean it really just i mean what what else can i say other than i like and enjoy my buoy and i was a very singular minded in that ain't i um but yeah no just the fact that i'm um you know the fact that i'm around a lot of very very heavy hitters in the knife community you know, um, Lynn Ray, um, Fisk, um, Cook, um, there, um, I think Bump is near, um, Bruce Bump is near me or no, he's up in Washington. Um, but I know there's just a bunch, uh, or Harvey Dean, he, he's the other one in Texas. Um, Harvey Dean's the other one. Um, you know, it's just some really big names for like the now, uh, you know, mo- more modern, um, you know, knife makers. Um, and the fact that I'm so near them and their work just, you know, by proxy kind of, um, makes me want to do things. <laughs> um, they're kind of, you know, the big reason why I kind of turned out how I do, um, how I did with, you know, just enjoying the forged blade enjoying the Bowie knives, enjoying teaching, uh, you know, with the Texarkana school being so close to me and kind of, and, you know, thinking about teaching and stuff like that, that has had a huge influence on me as a maker. Well, uh, when I was down there and when I met you, I, I felt like the whole place was bent towards uh, kind of cool, cool. I, I mean, we were we were 30 miles from a place called Cut and Shoot. That's what I mean. I was like, mm-hmm. I like yeah. Texas. <laughs> this yeah, is it's great. Place. It's great. Ain't it? uh, gun Barrel yeah, City. <laughs> it's just Gun Barrel City. It just feels like yeah. it's in the air. Uh, independence mm-hmm. and and knives kevin burgess of burgess forge thank you so much for coming on the knife junkie podcast it's been a real pleasure continue our uh, continuing our conversation and i look forward to more so do i man let's go <laughs> all right thank you sir Have a good one. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Kevin Burgess of Burgess Forge. Check out his work on Instagram. Uh, that's Burgess underscore Forge. And then also uh, on BurgessForge.com. Beautiful, beautiful bowies. I know we have a lot of uh, uh, fans of that style of knife uh, on this show. You got to check out his work. And uh, if you're a collector or a high class user, uh, definitely go check that out. And also uh, definitely check out the Wednesday supplemental and Thursday night knives coming up this week for Jim working his magic behind the switcher. I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer.
Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm-hmm.